Uh, thank you. Real op great opportunity for me to be here. I thank uh, Mark for the invitation and the organizers. Um, I'll ask one question, uh, one thing of you. During the question and answer period, I'm really severely hearing impaired. So get really close to that microphone and pretend, pretend you're Tom Jones or someone um, and use it. I have to, um, by regulations, disclose that I'm associated with an antibody company. What I'm going to tell you is a really brief story, um, very compressed, about what we've been doing in retinal circuitry. Um, we all have different definitions for things. Our idea is that a connectome is a complete graph of some neural volume. One of the real problems is deciding what that volume should be so that you have a canonical selection of neurons. And I come from sort of a background in remote sensing where we're really interested in ground truth. And we heard some discussion of reverse solutions today, or we might call them inverse solutions in remote sensing. And what we're trying to do is provide the basis to decide among some solutions and models. I'll also mention something we call CMP, which is putting molecular tags in our databases. And then um, I will skip over excitation mapping. What we've done is take one of many possible solutions to building a connectome. We've built one retinal connectome, and the first step is to harvest. We're old-fashioned. We do manual sectioning. It shouldn't be a barrier to generation, generating any connectome. It's relatively small in terms of the number of sections, 400 sections. But the key thing is that we have embedded molecular information that's important to us in understanding retinal circuitry. Um, some of those signals we've stuck in are small molecule signals, including glutamate, glycine, glutathione, GABA. And so we have multispectral maps that insert into the uh, electron microscopic data. Um, we've imaged at synaptic scale. That's two nanometer resolution. You can't quite get gap junctions that way, but I'll show you how we get around that problem. Um, essentially, the database that we've done in, in reconstructing this piece of the interplexiform layer is about 16 and a half terabytes of raw data with backups and also um, transformed serving data uh, requires about 50 terabytes of live storage. If you've cut your sections and you've captured your sections, how do you turn it into a volume? We worked heavily with the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute at the University of Utah, specifically Ross Whitaker and Dolga Tazdizen, and used a series of automated tools to build the volume automatically faster than we can capture it. I won't go into the details of that because I really want to get to what is probably the serious problem, and that is annotation and mining. Um, we end up with a volume that is comprised of some 370 slices, each of about 1,000 images each. And the color um, sections here indicate slices in the, in the volume where we have added molecular information that's of particular interest to us. Our first foray into annotation is something we call Viking. It's just a browser. That's all it is. Um, it uses well-established techniques. Basically what we do is develop the volume, serve it up from a web server. We use an optimized tile strategy so that we can use it under any internet condition. Um, Viking itself simply reads the transforms. We don't create a single monolithic volume. We use the raw data or, or the optimized data and apply the transforms on the fly using GPU processing. So really what we're doing is um, just simply positioning textures in a window full of data at any given time. We have extensions to the browser which is really important. That's our annotation module, which connects to a web services interface where we keep our annotation database and then have query tools so we can study what we're doing. Um, James Anderson was really responsible for developing this in my laboratory. And basically, the, the, the concepts underlying Viking are just industry standard concepts, Google Earth style concepts, um, basic. Um, standard HTTP communications, 
one of the key points I'd like to, I'd like to stress is that at this early stage in connectomics analysis, I think it's really important to let the ontologies float for a while and then we'll settle them down later. It'll be relatively easy to remap them to curated ontologies and I'd argue that maybe the curated ontologies aren't really mature yet. Um, and then web-based analysis tools. At any rate, um, all of the development of Viking is simply basic web programming. Um, so this is sort of Viking in use. We're loading up a volume. And what I've done here is demonstrate uh, a couple of points. This volume is publicly available. You can ask us for a login and we'll give it to you and you can fly through it on your own. Um, what I'm going to do here is demonstrate we've opened up the first slice of the volume. The color represents some molecular data which I'm turning off. Um, we're a little cropped on the left still, that's okay. Um, zooming into the volume, contrast is a little high. The structures around that rough endoplasmic reticulum cap in a glial cell are ribosomes. They're about 19 nanometers in diameter. We have two nanometer resolution here. We're able to jump to individual cells. So this cell 514 is green because it has glycine in it. And um, it's a cell at this point is slice 30. We're going to jump through a number of synapses onto it. It receives um, um, axon somatic synapses on its cell body. It receives a series of amacrine cell synapses, some from peptidergic cells onto some processes. So this is basically a bookmark tour through this cell and some key features. This is a channel that going by pretty fast that demonstrates that one of the inputs was GABAergic. There's an output onto a ganglion cell shown here. Um, this is at the arrow points to a process that's making a gap junction with this particular cell 514 and I'll come back to the issue of gap junctions momentarily. Um, some surprising connections. So this is just a fast tour through the connection library of one cell and I'll show you where it goes in just a second when it finishes. In fact what I might do is just go ahead and jump to the end. or the beginning. That's the case maybe. Let's jump to the end. One of the things I want to point out is we're interested in more than gap junctions and synapses. We're also interested in adherence junctions, the positions of glia, the positions of microglia. There's more to making up a nervous system than just doing the wiring diagram, even though that's what, what we're really interested in in this presentation right now. Once, what I want to emphasize is that all of our annotations in this volume are manual. We're using a crowdsourcing approach. There is no automated system that identifies our synapses or gap junctions for us. In fact, undergraduates are cheap and numerous and annotate just as well as anyone. So it's a really effective approach for us. But once we've annotated everything, this is where your d domain knowledge comes into play. This is where your specific knowledge about your biological problem becomes important. So we have a number of tools that really help us um, mine into the data more aggressively. Um, we use automated, automated network graph generation, automated geometry, automated rendering, and then we have some molecular segmentation tools that are offline that we can apply to the volume. So this is a very early rendering of some 650 neurons that are surrounded by about 350 Mueller glia and 100 microglia uh, that comprise the Internuclear layer, interplexiform layer, and part of the ganglion cell layer of the rabbit retina. The key point is this is about 5% annotation of the interplexiform layer uh, at the time this was generated. We're up to about 12% now, and that's getting pretty dense in terms of the number of processes, but we're nowhere near done. What I'm going to do is give some examples. Why would you do this? And one of the answers is we actually don't know the connectivity completely for any neuron in the interplexiform layer. 
and our goal was to get a complete picture of this. So what we decided to do is look first at a cell that is well known to a lot of retinal biologists called the A2 amacron cell. That's that big gold cell there. And it's the primary cell in the rod pathway of the retina. And there are three cells surrounding it in this image. It gets inputs from about 75 to 80 cells. And the three processes that are going by it, there's a, a strong green process, and that process is from a rod bipolar cell. This cyan process is from an on-cone bipolar cell, and this is an off-cone bipolar cell. There are many in the field that this cell talks with, but these are three representative ones um, that we're interested in. One of the problems is you just can't look at the 3D structure of cells and fly around and say, I want to look at some synapses. You need some redaction of the data. So our real approach, this is our real tool, GraphViz, which generates a reduced edge um, graph network. And then we can fly into it and look at interesting things. We can pick up data from it, dive back into Viking, and look at particular structures. So this is a synapse between a gabergic amacron cell and an on-cone bipolar cell that we've zoomed into here. I'm not going to show this whole movie for the sake of time. I'm going to move on, if I can. Jump ahead. The other things we can do are to look at stick figure graphs of individual cells. This has a number of utilities. The one that's shown here is actually error correction. So we've discovered that on this bipolar cell is actually a gap in the data set that doesn't make sense. So we can fly from that gap right back into the volume, go find it, and discover that we've got a process that is an island, as shown in gold, that isn't connected to its nearest neighbor. And so we just connect it. We've now healed the database, and we're done with that particular cell. But more importantly, we can find individual synapses to investigate. We'll let this finish. OK. So why are we doing all of this? Uh, this is where, again, as I mentioned, the domain knowledge is really important. What we want to do is build and refine system models for retina processing. And, and one of the barriers in doing this from the connectome data is how do you know your, your models are correct? How do you know what you want to look at? How do you know when you've discovered new things? So that it requires an expert, but it's also possible to, to design queries because you can create rules according to what we already know about retina. For example, bipolar cells never talk to bipolar cells. So if you see a bipolar, bipolar loop, you can flag that as an error. Cells don't talk to themselves. If you see self-talking loops, you can flag that as an error. Flagging novelty is a little bit more difficult, but we've been able to do that as well. We can validate our graphs in a variety of ways. We're interested in class statistics, so one of the things I won't be able to talk about in detail here, but I, I think it's important to mention, is that I came from this from the perspective that neurons were going to be sort of average ensembles of their class, and that they were going to kind of make the same numbers of connections with the cells that they were supposed to be talking to. The other perspective is molecular biological, and that is that connectivity is extremely precise and cells make very few errors. Our data are pushing us towards the mole bio view rather than the broad statistical model of a neuron. That neurons pass up opportunities to make connections in order to make the right connection at the right location in the cell. The other things we actually are really interested in doing is expanding our definition of what constitutes a connection. Synapses in the retina are really complicated. They come in a number of types. There are more than one kind of synaptic ribbon in the retina. They have different geometries. They have different numbers of ribbons, different volumes that they occupy in the presynaptic terminal. There are postsynaptic geometry variations opposite the same type of synaptic ribbon. So there are a number of things that we're trying to learn about organization that basically means we couldn't have prefigured our ontology. So we need a plastic ontology that we can expand as we investigate. And then refining the data is something we're able to do with our set because we can actually go back and re-image the same regions at higher resolution. We can reprobe and have reprobed um, the molecular set with additional probes now. So one of the things I wasn't able to stress is the fact that we're actually able to use those molecular data to validate identities. 
and also to define cells that we want to hunt. So we're able to look up 12 cells that have the signatures of A2 amacron cells and build them instead of having to build everything and find them afterwards. We can also extend the, the volume, which is one issue we're working on right now. So in terms of retina, we have a number of challenges that we're, we're trying to dig out. First is that there are over 60 cell classes in the mammalian retina. Non-mammalians have even more complex retinas, 150 classes in zebrafish retina. The edges are our neurochemical connections um, and much more complex than that. The canonics are that we figure that a 250 micron diameter field captures everything we need for a first pass view of a retinal connectome. The problem is there are lots of ways to connect neurons together. And the fact is that if you look at the uh, possibility of uh, the combinatorics of 60 neurons connected to five of its neighbors, it's more than we have time to fool with. And the answer is the retina probably only uses 15 to 30 of those possibilities. Only a few of them are good networks. Most of them are useless. So which ones are they? So a quick summary on the, a, on the A2 amacron cell, why it's so interesting. All non-mammalians use a two-tier pathway to get rod signals out of the retina. So rods drive by polar cells, there's a, a, a gain term at that synapse, and then they drive ganglion cells as a gain term at that synapse for a network gain of G1, G2. Mammalians have done something tricky. Rods directly drive a selective rod by polar cell which does not talk to any ganglion cells at all. They all talk to A2 amacron cells. The A2 amacron cell is a fan out device, probably has a gain of roughly one through gap junctions or low gain inhibitory synapses to drive cone bipolar cells which put another gain step in the system. And this is why mammals have much better scotopic vision than virtually any other vertebrate. This is how we thought it worked and that is that rods drive rod by polar cells and on the left side we'll see that there is a synaptic drive to off channels on the right side a coupling drive to on channels. We've understood this for a long time. I would say this was discovered by electron microscopy that no physiology on the planet would have worked out this circuitry diagram even to this day. So our first job was to mine this cell harder and find out what was going on. And I won't go through this image, but what we're able to do is, is find lots of partners to one cell and look at all the possible connections that those partners make. The summary for this cell is that before we started this, this project, we knew that these cells made connections with about seven other different kinds of cells. We now know that there are 14 different partners and that there are at least 18 different connection modes. For modeling, this is a real challenge because these include volume conduction uh, signaling pathways through dopamine, a variety of classical ionotropic mechanisms. It's, a, it's probably one of the most complicated cells we've ever found. In the process, we found a number of new connections nobody anticipated, but which go a long ways towards explaining some of the unique physiological features of this cell. Um, a quick dive into other cells like the A1 amacron cell, which is another part of the rod pathway, and it was thought to be selectively associated at its terminals with rod bipolar cells. And what we were able to discover is that this cell actually has a lot of cone drive high up on its dendrites close to its cell body. In fact, it receives massive glycinergic input at that point and heavy GABAergic input further on down the dendrites. The reason this is relevant is that there was a major paper recently in Neuron describing this cell as the parent of a hundred isolated little microcircuits at, its, at the tips of its dendrites. Um, that can't possibly be true if these other networks are in play. And we were able to mine specific crossings to look at potential synaptic um, interactions. This is a particularly fun one because these two cells, 476 and 591, are in the rod pathway and they're received, supposed to receive synaptic input only from rod pathway bipolars. 
but they're getting a ri ribbon input from a wide field cone bipolar cell. So they do get active photopic input, which we actually knew physiologically but had no anatomical basis for. Um, I won't go into the details of this diagram, but it begins to expand the scope of what these cells do, and more importantly, it gives us an evolutionary and genetic hook into where these cells came from and what they may be doing. We can re-image to view gap junctions. Um, I'll skip this over. An important point is that adjacency is not important in the retina because most cells will pass right by each other and never make any contacts. Only synapses, only gap junctions matter. Um, I'll skip over the glial story just to get to the summary. One of, of the things we want to do, we wish to expand our data collection, build new connectome volumes, incorporate molecular tools into Viking. We already have public access active. Richer network graph techniques. We're using GraphPhys right now. We overload it pretty fast. Um, identify common circuit designs and emphasize the point that these sorts of approaches are as good in liver and kidney as they are in brain and retina. And thank you for your attention. We have a minute. A nice uh, panel discussion where there's opportunity for more questions. We have a question from the audience. Uh -oh. yeah, terrific presentation, intimidating level of connectivity. Um, so the issue of scalability of the approaches you use, uh, and they're, they're marvelous tools, and I'm just wondering, uh, on your last futures direction you had, mouse, macaque, human. I'm wondering how, how long that will, will you get 10x faster on these methods or are there just intrinsic bottlenecks that'll prevent it from being faster? Uh, there, there are bottlenecks in acquisition, but that isn't stopping us from starting. It would take us about um, six months of direct EM time dedicated to, for example, do a human volume at this point. So for us, our canonical volumes are not as big as cortical volumes, and we can move along pretty fast. Um, the, the real bottleneck actually is annotation, because there's no point in having these data sets unless you can mark them up. And right now, nothing is better than humans at marking up the data, and it doesn't even need professionals to do that. Reading the data, mining the data, the only bottlenecks we're having is that the software is not optimized for performance with large data sets, but that's just recoding some stuff. Um. Okay. 